Good morning, everyone. This is Ranger Jake here in Yellowstone National Park, and I uh, want to thank you for following along for our 150th anniversary virtual video series. Uh, sadly, today is the last one, but uh, we saved the best for last. We're joined yeah. today by Cam Shawley. Uh, we're in the superintendent's office today, and he's going to just kind of recap the whole year and what's been going on. There's a few things that have happened this year. A couple. A couple things. A couple things. So we're going to, uh, I'll go ahead and jump behind the camera and we'll have this conversation. I just want to, thanks for joining us. All right, Cam, so where do you want to start? It's hard to know where to start. I think what I'll say first is how proud I am of this team. Uh, I, I can't, if you think about everything that's been thrown our way over the last couple of years, um, I can't think of a team in the National Park Service that could handle what we've handled as well as uh, the team here has. And so I think uh, we had a, a as good a year as possible, considering everything that happened. But I, we have a long way to go, and this park uh, continues to deliver uh, one challenge after another uh, for all of us. And uh, you know, I, I think that considering this is the 150th, uh, it'll be memorable for a couple of reasons. Um, obviously, the flood happening in the 150th year is probably the thing that's going to stand out the most. Uh, but I also think that um, we were able to kind of stay the course with a lot of the things that we planned uh, around commemorating the 150th, and I think that was really important. And, and we're not only taking advantage of this moment in time to kind of commemorate 150 years of Yellowstone as America's uh, and the world's first national park, but um, you know, a real concerted effort I think was very successful in um, engaging tribes at much, much higher levels and um, having them back in the park with us regularly uh, engaging visitors. And I think that was uh, tremendously important um, for the park, uh, for the 150th, and for um, you know the probably hundreds of thousands of people that got to see and interact directly with some of our affiliated tribal members that were able to come to the park. And so I think, uh, we can talk specifics about the flood and and some of the things with the 150th and some other things around the priorities that we have moving forward but there's just not we had so much going on absent the 150th and absent the flood already um you know with increasing visitation with um you know about a quarter billion dollars in great american outdoors act projects with improving housing you know reconfiguring our budget structure um, dealing with the staffing visitor imbalances that we see that we need to continue focusing on in, in the future, uh, the team just stepped up again. And, um, you know, we have a lot, a lot of work to do together. And that's, that's down to the individual. I mean, there's individual responsibility when you look at the teams that we have and the cohesiveness and the ability to get things done. Um, it's it's a collective effort, yes, but it's also about our, our team members as individuals um, being leaders, at, irrespective of what level they're at. And I think when you uh, compound um, so many good people together and, and they form these incredible teams, or just the ability to get things done is um, really incredible. And I I think it's also important that we continue to watch out for each other. We've seen the stressors on the workforce and some of the things that we need to work on from uh, taking care of each other and that kind of thing. I think that's gonna be really important moving forward. So let's, for somebody who you know doesn't follow the ins and outs of everything about Yellowstone and what's going on, uh, people that have never met you, let's go ahead and pr give a little context. You know, What's your background? How long you've been in Yellowstone? What's happened kind of since you've been in Yellowstone? Well, I've been here four years next month, so I got here in October of 2018. Um, prior to uh, Yellowstone, I was a regional director for the Midwest region uh, based out of Omaha. So I had uh, all the national parks between the Dakotas and Ohio and Canada, Arkansas. Uh, great job. And I was associate director for visitor resource protection prior to that. Uh, superintendent of Natchez Trace Parkway and uh, chief of ranger operations in Yosemite and a um, 
considerable number of other jobs uh, throughout my career, but uh, really has been a true privilege to be here for the last four years, and especially considering COVID and the floods and and everything else that we've gone through. Um, you know, this is this has been a, a good place to be for the last uh, several years, especially with this team. It's gonna yeah. So you mentioned COVID. We had you know the park was closed for the first time really that we're aware of like in its existence where the whole park was closed. So when the flood happened, we it seems like we had some practice on to tr trying to solve big problems on the fly. Yeah, I mean, this this team is, um, for better or worse, really good at closing the park. Go <laughs> government, government shutdowns and uh, uh, COVID and, and things like that, we've become pretty good at it. Uh, we're good at emergency operations and uh, we're good at evacuating the park. We're good at uh, damage assessments. We're we're excellent at uh, um, getting the park reoperational um, after closures. We're we're really good at major projects, and those are all things that happened. Um, we're good at outreach with the gateway communities and, and communications, and um, you know when you look at what happened June thirteenth. I mean, if you think about that first morning, you know, I think I woke up at 5.30 and saw 29 texts on my phone. I said, something happened last night. Uh, and I think, you know, you're, you're, you're trying to f figure out uh, in a very, very challenging and complicated situation what the best steps to take um, in the moment are. And you've got no power for multiple days. We're, we're dumping 200,000 gallons of wastewater into the Gardner River, um, you know, we're trying to make sure everybody's safe and, and account for the workforce. You know, we've got 10,000 visitors in the park uh, that need to be moved out. Uh, you've got thousands of visitors, in this case in Gardner, that were trapped because the road on the other side was also uh, closed. So what kind of community support do you need to give? I think uh, that first two or three days, you know, we were running out of a Honda generator that you put out on the on the porch out here, running extension cords into here, and that's how we were basically operating our computers and lights and things like that. And you know the the notion, the fact that we evacuated ten thousand people in in twenty four hours, um, the fact that we didn't uh, lose any lives, um, didn't have any major injuries, is a testament to the staff and the team and, and their competency. Um, you know, you look at. Jason Murphy or some of these other incredible folks being able to, uh, in relatively short order, get the wastewater uh, diverted from the gar dumping into the Gardner River into uh, 1960s old infrastructure. You know, I think uh, our our ability to to think on the fly and solve problems was truly tested here. And you know, once again, the team just just performed incredibly and. I think, uh, you know, with 36 hours, we had the wastewater. Uh, for those that don't know how we did that, there were some old percolator ponds uh, from the 30, that were used between the 30s and the 60s that were still in, uh, in place. Yeah, it's probably one of the first times you'll hear me say I'm glad that some 1960s infrastructure was still around. And we basically, our, our teams trenched into that pond and diverted the wastewater from going into the river into the pond, which has gotten us through the summer. And then they've worked on uh, a bunch of different solutions that will help get us through the winter winter and future years. Um, but the damage assessments obviously were done very quickly, um, evacuating the park, realized very quickly that the north entrance and northeast entrance roads were critically damaged, um, completely impassable, unsafe. and that the north side of the park was hit much, much harder than the south. I mean, we figured that out relatively quick, quickly. We had damage on the south, uh, but uh, nowhere near what we had uh, on the north side of the park here. And everything from the back country, you know, looking for people that are in the back country and getting them evacuated if necessary, getting the damage assessed in the back country, get the damage assessed in these two corridors. You know, we had some close calls with our wastewater systems at Canyon and Old Faithful. Um, you know, we had a couple other major road sections damaged, mudslides, things like that. I mean, the team just was in lockstep on what do we need to do, and 
we started just building from there. We figured out very quickly that the old Gardner Road, which is a, an 1879 one lane dirt road, which was impassable to four by fours two or three days after the flood because it was so saturated. And keep in mind, this road is you know, 10, 12 feet wide, dirt road. Uh, but we realized that was really going to be the only way, after looking at the damage in the canyon, to get reconnected with Gardner. And our roads crews got to work relatively immediately within three days of the flood and dropped 21,000 tons of material onto that road to get it passable as a one lane. And this whole summer, that's how employees and essential services and now the school bus and and others uh, have gotten uh, to and from um, Mammoth and Gardner. And uh, as we had the Corps of Engineers and Federal Highways and some others come in and look at the Gardner River Canyon, we realized, unlike Northeast Entrance, I'll talk about um, the Gardner River Canyon was irreparable in regard to like a quick uh, temporary solution or going in and filling the road ba base back up. And so we made a call very early. Um, you know, toward the end of June to go ahead and begin plans to two lane the old Gardner Road as the most viable short term option. And, you know, in hindsight, I'm really glad we did because um, what's happening out here right now, for those, in, you know, as a, a point in time, we're, we're in the end of September of, uh, of 2022. And we started the two lane process with Federal Highways and, and a contractor, HK. Uh, around July 6th and so in about two and a half months they four, a two lane four miles of that road already and are, are prepping the surface for paving as we speak and um, you know the likelihood that we'll use that road for years is very very real and so we want to make sure it's safe and engineered properly modern safety standards and all of those kind of things um, but that's all happened in, in a normal situation, would have taken years and years of planning and design and construction uh, within months. And, uh, you know, we feel pretty like we're on a good track and, um, you know, we'll, 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 see, we'll see what happens, but I'm very confident in the teams that we have working on the Old Gardner Road for serving us for future years. So uh, one of the strategic priorities is, you know, coalitions and partnerships. And just, you know, to give some perspective from behind the scenes, how many people are involved in, you know, the recovery efforts and putting these roads in and like, you know, when the flood first happened, like who all showed up and offered support? I think being behind it, like myself, I was really surprised. So just to kind of give people some perspective. Well, as far as what happened in the park, um, it really was the park service, especially initially, and our partners in the park like Delaware North and Zantera and other, other uh, operators that operate large portions of, of the park. Um, can't say enough about Zantera and Delaware North for um, being extremely responsive. I mean, you think about, you know, mid-June isn't July and August, but there's a lot of visitors here in mid-June and we were fully operational for the most part. And uh, to basically shut down the entire Northern Loop and then the entire Southern Loop and, and do that within 24 to 30 hours. And you think about all the people in the hotels and the campgrounds and uh, a lot of good partnerships with the partners in the park. As far as everything I just described um, initially in that first two weeks, it was pretty much all park service. A um, lot of communications with the communities, with the states. Uh, there was a point in time we thought maybe the old Gardner Road might be the only way to evacuate visitors from Gardner. Um, as in, you know, you've, you, you had this uh, point in time where we realized the South Loop could, could probably open up pretty quick. We got that reopened in eight days. How are you gonna do that? You know, you got a million people a month in Yellowstone, you can't fit, you only know, have one loop open, you can't fit a million people in half the park. Um, how are you gonna ensure you've got the right amount of traffic in? And, you know, you've got kind of this weird, uh, you know, communities like Gardner, Cook City, Silvergate, looking at a horrific summer economically, uh, knowing that their entrances are probably not gonna open. And then you've got Cody and West Yellowstone and Jackson saying, hey, let's get open as quickly as possible. And so uh, those relationships and partnerships and, and, and what 
what is really important is that you have those relationships before you need them mm -hmm. and not, you know, when something happens, you know, pulling out your phone and asking who, who should you call, knowing who to call um, and being connected with them and having those relationships and partnerships established um, as we did going into this flood. We had done a lot of work with communities, states and counties and other stakeholders, obviously through COVID. So I think that helped actually in many ways. Um, but, but those relationships were absolutely essential. If for no other reason, just communicating what's going on in the park, uh, what the timelines are, what we were thinking and that kind of thing. So, and now in the recovery efforts, we had, you know, HK, like how, how is it even possible to do something in months versus in years? I mean, like what it's like, I personally know, you know, there was other projects that were taking place in the park, but I mean, are you able to just say, stop doing that, come over here? Like, how does that process work? The most critical external partner uh, in this entire process has been federal, the Federal Highway Administration under the Department of Transportation. And it's another example, we work very closely with Federal Highways on all of our transportation projects in this park, we have very, very good relationships with them. Um, we had, in this case, a major contractor, HK, working one of our Great American Outdoors Act projects between West Thumb and Old Faithful. So they were in the park with equipment, with personnel, with materials. And after the Park Service did the one lane effort in the, in the last two weeks of June, uh, in that time frame, talking to Federal Highways about um, how do we get the right resources on these two corridors to get them reopened uh, going into the winter. And that was kind of our general discussion and Federal Highways absolutely stepped up, uh, pulled HK up <clears throat> initially from the project at West Thumb uh, to begin the two lane process here while they were ramping up for, for a, a more extensive effort here on Old Gardner Road. Um, Federal Highways released $60 million in emergency funding, which was absolutely critical to us getting to work immediately um, they were able to issue contracts very, very quickly to HK for this corridor to Gardner and to another major company, Optidol, for the northeast entrance and, uh, and then provide the level of support with our folks um, uh, to, to get the work done that's, that's being accomplished right now in, in the time frame that uh, I would consider to be a record. Um, and within that structure, you know, we have our landscape architects and facilities managers and things like that that are in constant contact with federal highways and, and the contractors on design and planning. And remember, there was no plan for, for Old Gardner Road especially, there was no design. And so you're talking about within weeks doing a design, there's a lot of engineering on that. Some people think, oh, what's the big deal of two lane in a dirt road? It's steep, it's four miles. Uh, in some, care, some areas it was, you know, 45 to 50 degree slopes down and up on either side of the road. And some of the work they've done has just been incredible to get four miles two laned in two and a half months. And all of the engineering that, and people that have been able to drive the road every day have kind of been able to see the progress. But people that haven't, uh, I've seen pictures and that kind of thing, but may not really understand the level of work and, and engineering that's going into to this road, and so that's been the epitome of a, a team effort, and uh, um, our relationship with Federal Highways, I think, previously helped us um, navigate this together much more effectively. So, we're you know the road's not yet done. We're gonna keep our fingers crossed that we hit the dates that were you know before the snow flies this winter. But in theory, we'll have this road that will be. People will be able to drive, the public will be able to go up and down this winter and we'll be able to plow and keep that open. Um, but if we, you know, you mentioned we were able to kind of keep on track with the summer with the 150 and everything. So I'll get us back on track to that. So if we think about all the things that we planned this summer, all the events that we had that were pre-flood, um, you know, we, we had a ribbon cutting of the Dunraven. Um, we have all these GOA projects that we're celebrating that are coming up. How does all of that you know, all these things that we're doing in the park, how does that play into the to the bigger vision, like the strategic priorities in the park moving forward, like into the future? 
Yeah, well, we, you know, we've got five strategic priorities. And what we decided this year, aside from, uh, as I mentioned, uh, heavy, heavy tribal engagement, um, was to also take advantage of the massive amount of work that's been going on over the last couple of years that is either finishing this year, like phase one of the housing improvement uh, project, or projects that we've um, formulated that we're gonna break ground on, really critical in, in very, a lot of different critical areas. So you mentioned Dunraven, great $30 million two-year project, um, substantially improved road that really hadn't been substantially improved since the 30s, um, and you know, a lot of infrastructure that was put into this park back in the 20s, 30s, and 40s, and especially in the roads corridors, needed a lot of work, as do a lot of our structures, um, historic structures, housing, wastewater systems. Um, and so I think, you know, we've kind of had this good balance of, and what we heard a lot and clear from the team was, you know, do us a favor and don't, don't have a, a 2,000 person event. Um, it's just too busy and too much, too much, too much going on. So I think we threaded the needle in, and really putting the, the the focus on the tribes and our partnerships with the, with tribal nations, um, looking at the tribes as as a uh, or looking at our tribal initiatives that we did this year as a a, 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 a launching point for the future, not just a one time thing like the tribal heritage center down at, at Old Faithful or Yellowstone Revealed, uh, the tribal encampment we did at Madison or having the Nez Perce come in and, and, and ride in, in their parade and um, all the kind of the, the tribal internships that we've set up with tribal colleges. There's all of those things I think are momentum for, for the future. And then when you look at the strategic priorities, you know, our focus on the core priority was really uh, a lot around housing improvements, which we've done substantial work on, and we've completed phase one, and we did the ribbon cutting in, as part of the 150th commemoration uh, for housing. And then, you know, a, a, a wide range of new projects, and um, like for Yellowstone rehabilitation, which has been going on for two years, but will really kick off next spring. We'll do a kind of a groundbreaking on that this fall. Um, one of the largest historic preservation projects in the entire country. And uh, we then continue to have, you know, if you think about strengthening the Yellowstone ecosystem, um, I think uh, an incredible effort to make progress with, with, with strengthening Yellowstone and, and, and getting it and keeping it into, in the condition that it's in today. I mean, if you think about we have more bison in Yellowstone right now than at any time uh, since Yellowstone became a park. And I think that's uh, very important. Um, we think the carrying capacity of Yellowstone as far as bison go is much, much higher than the number we have. We're obviously constrained in many ways, socially and politically by uh, fears of brucellosis transmission, uh, especially in the state of Montana. And we're gonna continue to work with Montana uh, to alleviate those fears, but we feel like we can balance both a higher bison population uh, in this park and help the state achieve their objectives of, of not transmitting brucellosis to livestock. Uh, if you look at the wolf issue, um, you know, last year was not a good year for wolves in Yellowstone, primarily because the state removed the quotas from two of the hunting units north of, of Yellowstone's boundary. We've gotten that reinstated. Uh, it's not, you know, it's, 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 it's unfortunate we went through last year, but a, a lot of good work by a lot of people. Uh, we had a great pup here this year. Um, some of that was a result of heavy mortality last year, but uh, with the quotas back in place uh, and an incredible group working in the wolf program, I feel very confident that um, wolves, which I find to be, or I feel are the kind of the cornerstone species in many ways, in this park, and I think the reintroduction was one of the most successful uh, wildlife conservation efforts uh, in the world back in the mid 90s, uh, has shown um, how important wolves are to this ecosystem uh, from a variety of, of fronts. And so getting those quotas back into place and getting Yellowstone wolves protected when they leave the park for a minimal amount of time each year um, 
was a challenge, but I think something that's going to work well and stay in place for, for the future. We've put a record amount of investment into native fish restoration. Uh, teams continue to do an outstanding job in that area. You know, I think about lake trout, not just the lake trout issue at Yellowstone. You think about that, you know, we've invested probably 10 or $12 million um, or more just in the last five or six years. And we've got that same level of effort probably for the next five. Um, but we're making significant progress, taking out almost 400,000 lake trout this year. Cutthroats are rebounding really nicely. And uh, it's not all about Lake Yellowstone. Uh, the teams are doing some really good work in other fisheries around the park. And, um, you know, we'll continue, continue those efforts. We're looking at, you know, um, quite a few other areas in regards to the ecosystem around uh, getting better with uh, preventing aquatic invasive species from, from entering the park. Uh, we've got a long way to go there, um, you know, prioritizing more effectively what the terrestrial invasives impacts are in the park and, and, and coming up with uh, more salient uh, eradication strategies for some of these non-native species that are, are going to proliferate in upcoming years and they're going to have heavy impacts on native species and it's something we need to pay attention to. You know, climate change and a lot of the work that we're doing in this event this year, one in 500 uh, year flood, I think all of us know that that one in 500 year flood could easily happen again next year, or at least in the next 10 years. And so, you know, we look at um, what are the impacts and effects of climate change. I think it's gonna be really important that we not just have kind of the data, the science that supports the changes happening. We, we need that, but more specifically, what the actual impacts are on species, which species can adapt which species can't, what are the best management actions that we take in the future for climate change. I think those are really, really important. And then, um, you know, there's a, a very small amount of this park that sees visitors. I mean, this park is 2.2 million acres, 1,750 acres are roads, parking lots, and pullouts. Um, our mission predominantly centers on conservation and preservation, but enjoyment uh, is, a, is an important part of our mission. And most of the enjoyment in this park comes through that 1,750 acre road corridors. And so, you know, it's important that we keep those corridors uh, in good condition. And if we think about the future, like what just happened this year, how do we rebuild for resiliency, knowing that more climate events are going to happen and uh, guard against um, having a future summer like we just did and really look for areas that are vulnerable understand that these road corridors were built, um, you know, 100 years ago at, at a time where climate change wasn't, wasn't even being discussed, really. Uh, same with our structures and almost any infrastructure you look at here uh, was, was constructed lo a long time ago. And so when we have opportunities to rebuild uh, infrastructure, whether it's roads or other things, that we take our time and really think about what the future threats might be to that infrastructure. And I think that's going to be really important moving forward as well. So, you know, we talk about all these things, what looking in the future, if you were to just kind of say, how, like, what's your gut feeling about the future for Yellowstone? Like, you know, being here and seeing the trajectory of things, how, what's your overall feeling? Well, I think we can be proud at where Yellowstone has come. I've said this a lot, but you know, the first 80, 90 years of Yellowstone, we got a lot of things wrong. We, we, we basically extirpated almost every predator in this park. Um, you know, we wiped out the bison numbers from tens of thousands to less than 25 animals. And we did not do a good job um, just 100 years ago. And we're talking 1920s. Uh, 50 years ago in the 60s, we're feeding bears out of garbage dumps. And uh, so visitors can see them and, and you know, we did not have, um, we were not really centered on conservation, you know, um, principles and ethics. Uh, and this last 50, 60 years, we've slowly put the pieces back together, this ecosystem, and I think we've done a good job. That doesn't mean that we've arrived or we can celebrate, but I would say unquestionably Yellowstone 150 years from an ecosystem health standpoint is better now than ever. Um, or at least since Yellowstone's become a national park. But we have a, a, a tremendously long way to go in the future. And so when we look at 
one of our priorities of providing a world-class visitor experience, you know, there's always a narrative out there about visitors overrunning the ecosystem and, you know, damaging resources. And, you know, we've approached um, visitation management, at least during my tenure here, I think very strategically and wanting to make sure that um, we have the right data and the right information to inform our decisions and that our decisions make sense and are defensible and that we take the right action at the right time for the right result. Um, it's a big park. You know, I think 1948 was the first year Yellowstone had a million people in it in a single year. Um, 1965 was the first year we had 2 million in the park in a single year. 1992 was 3 million, 2015 was 4 million. Uh, we kind of peaked out at 4.2 in 2016, which was the year of the centennial. And then we went backwards about a quarter million. We hovered around 4 million for uh, the last several years. And um, there's always a question about how many visitors uh, should be allowed in the park. I think most people that travel the backcountry of Yellowstone realize that uh, a very minuscule number of people, I think our estimate is 97%, never get more than a half mile away from their car. Um, and so we have significant issues in certain parts of the park in certain times of the year that have to be managed. And as inc visitation increases in those corridors, it'll be important that we take the actions that are necessary to manage those, those visitors effectively. And the kind of the four areas that we're, we look at in our strategy there is, you know, really understanding what the impacts are of increasing visitation on the resources of this park and getting it kind of out of the abstract. Like, you know, what resources are being impacted, where, why, it's not everywhere. What actions do we have that we can take to mitigate, prevent, uh, some of those impacts. I mean, that's a really critical thing. And I think the team's done a great job of doing some incredible monitoring of resources in some of these um, <clears throat> high density traffic areas to understand what those impacts actually are. Second area we look at is what are the impacts to, to staffing and infrastructure and operations. And I think that's uh, a much bigger impact than on resources, to be honest. When you look at the data from resources, we're, we're not seeing huge impacts on resources from visitors. We are seeing huge impacts on staffing, on infrastructure. You know, people don't think about if you uh, have a million more people in this park every year and you flush the toilet, um, you know, a million people flush the toilet five times a day, um, what's that do to your wastewater treatment facility capacity? When you're looking at staffing levels that are give or take flat or uh, declining from 2010 in a visitation trend line that's substantially higher that as that delta grows that's impact there on staff and you need people to manage people so understanding what our staffing needs are what uh, what types of strategies we can employ to ensure our, stat our, our staffing is um, you know put in the right places to have maximum positive impact is is also a challenge the third area we look at is visitor experience. And you know, the survey work that was done in 2016 and 18 was, has been tremendously helpful in understanding what the visitors think. And what we found is what we think visitors think isn't always what visitors think. And uh, you know, they have a, we continue to have a, you know, a, a, a low to mid 90s, good to excellent visitor experience um, rating. 70% of visitors to this park are first time visitors. And I think that most of them are here for the first time. They've never seen a bison in the wild. They've never seen an elk. And when they do, they're gonna stop their car and they're gonna get out and they're, that's why they came. The 30% that are irritated are the employees, the locals, and the repeat visitors who've been here and seen thousands of bison. They know exactly where they wanna go. And it's our job to kind of reconcile uh, those things to the best degree possible. Uh, we've done some really good things, I think, um, piloting the electric vehicle shuttles last year at Canyon. I think there's some real promise in that technology. You know, we're doing a shuttle feasibility study between Old Faithful and Madison. You know, we'll look at that. I think that people that think that a shuttle system park-wide is the solution for everything um, 
need to really think about what that means. And uh, our estimate is it's probably at least 60 to 80 million of capital investment to do a shuttle system just in the Midway Geyser corridor. Uh, for those of, of you that don't like development in parks, you know, that would mean if we did the shuttle system, putting an 800 space parking uh, lot at Madison, putting an additional 800 space parking lot at Old Faithful. You've got to build a garage for the mechanics. You've got dispatchers, drivers, others that need housing. Uh, you probably have a, about a 15 million a year to operate that system. And, you know, I think there's a lot of things to evaluate there, but, you know, just snap your fingers and put a shuttle system in place is, is not necessarily uh, the greatest solution, at least here for Yellowstone. It does make a lot of sense in other parks in the system. Um, the fourth one and final area we look at is gateway gateway community impacts, um, recreational access, economic spending. And so really understanding and having the right data and information in each one of those four categories is really the driver behind the decisions that we'll make in the future for visitor use in Yellowstone. So, and to give a little bit more context about the four areas that you just spoke about, um, how many employees work in Yellowstone? You know, if you talk about in like well, just National Park Service to start with? Uh, we, we hover around a thousand employees and volunteers, about 800 are actual employees. Um, give or take 400 of those are seasonals. They're here for a, six months of the year or so. And the other 400 are permanent, um, kind of full-time year-round employees. Okay, and then if we expand that to our partners, so Zantera and Delaware North and all the other you know, concessionaires that operate in the park, what is that number? In a normal year, uh, that means I think uh, if you just took, uh, well, uh, COVID's kind of thrown a monkey wrench into everything, but, uh, you know, I, 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 the concession employee population is in, in the three to 4,000 range between yep. Zantera and Delaware North and Yellowstone Park Service Stations and MedCorp and that kind of thing. Okay. And then we talked about the impacts to infrastructure. So, uh, what are we talking about infrastructure wise? Like most people, when you come, you see the buildings and visitor centers, but there's a lot of hidden infrastructure in Yellowstone, like hidden by design. What's, you know, what's the, the amount dollar wise that we have of infrastructure in Yellowstone? So we have about a $4 billion asset portfolio, meaning that if you, if you had to replace every single road building system in Yellowstone, the replacement value is around $4.2 billion. All right, which is a, a huge number. Um, the uh, the other thing too with the impacts. So when we talk about all the things that we've had lined up, the Old Faithful to West Thumb, that was one road project that was taking place in the park, and why we were able to take advantage. So if you were to total up all of the projects that we have in the pipeline that we're hoping to do, like say in the next five years, what's that look like? So of that four point two billion, about. We, a billion of that's considered deferred maintenance, meaning that uh, we've either neglected it and not performed the right cyclic maintenance and repair preventative maintenance, um, and, it, and the, the condition has deteriorated so substantially that um, you know a lot of our projects are um, like the road between West Yells, or West Thumb and Old Faithful, we're rebuilding a lot of that road. Um, we have wastewater systems that are way over capacity. And, and we have, I think, seven systems that we manage. Um, and so that's kind of a hidden thing people don't see if you don't have wastewater systems that are functional you cannot hold, uh, host visitation effectively, obviously. And you also uh, substantially put the environment at risk. And so as we look at you know, the future, and you're not gonna build your way out of this. I mean, if Yellowstone was a municipality and the population went up by millions over, over a couple decades, you know, you would see more schools, you would see roads being expanded to four lanes or you know whatever the case is we're not going to do that here and so there's a saturation point and i don't know exactly what it is in a threshold where um, we'll need to take much more aggressive actions to control visitation um, in order to 
everything I just talked about, protect resources, ensure that our infrastructure can, can handle uh, the right amount of visitation, be it wastewater treatment or roads and bridges. But right now we have a massive deferred maintenance backlog in this park. I, I would argue that uh, a billion might be a little bit low even, but let's say that's what it is. 25% uh, of your asset portfolio and deferred maintenance is not a good ratio. You're always gonna have something, um, but it's usually not gonna be 25% of, of the portfolio. And so a lot of good work's been done over the, over the last several years and in, in for longer than that at getting a lot of these roads and infrastructure improved. We've been very fortunate to um, have this window of opportunity with Great American Outdoors Act uh, funding that's become available specifically for deferred maintenance and we've taken advantage of that. Uh, hundreds of millions of dollars in project funding to address some of our most uh, serious deferred maintenance needs and you know, it's another thing that happened with the flood is we had multiple projects going on that were non-flood related and we felt it was really important to keep going on those and not stop. Uh, even though the flood has been all consuming for, for most of us, um, we needed to recognize we, we have an opportunity here to, to really make significant improvements in many, many areas of the park and continuing that uh, very important. So, um Two questions. Uh, one of them is one more serious question. That'll be a more kind of a fun question. But the first one, you listed all the different things that we're doing in the park, all the strategic priorities, all the things we're working on. If you were pressed to pick one thing that is like the most important thing, whether it's the short term for some limited amount of time, like what's the thing that you know you would kind of elevate to say this is the thing that we need to focus on the most at this point in time. I, I don't, so they're all interlinked. <clears throat> um, and I don't think I covered all five of the, of the park strategic priorities. So focus on the core is the workforce. Um, I would argue that the, we can talk about strengthening the Yellowstone ecosystem and providing a, a world-class visitor experience and partnerships and all that kind of thing. But if we don't do a good job in managing the workforce and dealing with all the stressors that, that, a, that a workforce of this size is under, none of the other priorities are going to, uh, we're not gonna succeed in most, in most other areas. Um, so I think that focus on the core is germane to all of the priorities. The second one, strengthen the Yellowstone ecosystem and heritage resources. The third is um, providing a, visitor, a world-class visitor experience. The fourth is investing in infrastructure. And the fifth is building coalitions and partnerships. But there's not a, a firm delineator between each one of those, they cross over. And so, you know, if you look at Fort Yellowstone, one of the most historic districts in the, in the country, and you look at the, the, the structures that we're sitting in and living in and working in and people are enjoying and, and, and visiting, um, it's strengthening heritage resources, that project, it's also investing in infrastructure. Um, it's also providing a world-class visitor experience for people to come and, and see and enjoy these incredible resources in better condition. And then you've got a huge component with the workforce that has to manage and protect and um, interpret uh, and educate the public. Um, and so, you know, I don't know if I can pick the one um, but I would suggest that of the five, if we don't do well and focus on the core, uh, we're not gonna do well on the other four. Gotcha. So uh, last question, when you were doing the introduction of all the jobs that you held, I can't help but notice that you uh, glazed over the fact that you were trails in Yellowstone. Was that your first job? Yeah. And um, what area of the park were you, did you work in? Yeah, so I worked in thoroughfare in 1990, the summers of 1990, 91. And uh, so, People that don't know where Thoroughfare is, it's in the very southeast corner of the park, uh, one of the most remote sections anywhere in the lower 48, and uh, my favorite part of the park. So uh, the question that I wanted to end on is, you know, being the superintendent, you're up here in Mammoth, a lot of stuff to deal with. Um, you know, what's the thing that you do in Yellowstone that re like kind of helps you re like remind like, you know, I get to work in Yellowstone, I get, you know, there's all these stressors, but what's the thing that you do that kind of 
recharges the batteries in Yellowstone? Well, I, I, getting into the Yellowstone backcountry, I think, is the most important thing for anyone uh, that works in this park. And um, you, you're able to kind of just remove yourself from, um, you know, the noise of politics or whatever issue is going to come up. There'll be five of them today. Uh, and remember why you're here and and why what we do is so important. And uh, when you get caught up in the moment of, of all the things that we're dealing with, and it doesn't matter what position you're in, um, that can be really hard to do, to really kind of get focus and think about, you know, why we're here and, and, and why what we do is so important. And I do think uh, the further and the deeper back into the back country, into the back country you get, uh, the uh, better, the easier it is to kind of keep that perspective and then come out and you really do feel recharged when, when that happens. But to see, you know, so much of this park never sees a visitor in a given year. And I mean, I, I've, except for this year, been very successful at getting, getting in, you know, well over 200 miles a year into the back country. And, you know, there's just so many spectacular places that aren't on the road corridor that, uh, I wish more and more people could see, sort of. <laughs> don't want to blow it up back yeah, there. Yeah, don't, I don't want everybody to go back there, but uh, it's it's hard to get to. It's it's a, uh, but it, you know it's. Um, and I would suggest to people that even if you can only get a mile or two off the road somewhere, that it's it's a completely different experience than, you know, sitting in your car in a pullout. Even though that's nice for some folks, and uh, you can see a lot from the road corridors. I think that. Uh, the real park is beyond the roads. Well, with that sage advice from our superintendent, Cam Shelley, I'm gonna jump back on the camera here. I wanna thank everybody for following us along. We had we did 16 videos this year, so we talked to a lot of different people. We started all the way back in March with Christina kicking yeah. off and just you know went through all the different subject matter experts. Um, so I wanna thank everybody who's followed us along. The 150th has been a pretty crazy year with all the events we did. The flood obviously was crazy, um, and then, but like you said, it's uh, through that kind of, whenever something bad happens, it forces everybody to come together. So I think we as a team, just to echo what you said, it's been, uh, it's been great to be, a, be here this year and experience everything. So thank you for following us along on this video series. I wanna thank Cam for taking the time to talk with us and kind of put the, uh, the bookend on this series. And quick, uh, quick shout out to this guy because uh, he's the one doing all these videos that you're able to watch and we're, we're happy to share these these uh, different perspectives with you. Um, but from the photos that you take that uh, let everybody in the world see what Yellowstone's really like to all the incredible support that you provide and, and things like this, uh, I truly appreciate that, Jake. Well, thank you. And uh, we'll uh, see you when you come visit Yellowstone. So thanks so much.